All right. Hey, Rachel, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Matt. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, excited to have you on. It was it was uh it was fun to see you on Wednesday. I did not know you rode bike. <laughs> we, well, I don't know that I can say I can. I was very slow, but <laughs> no. Hey, you got up. You got up the hill for for the for my listeners. Uh, one of one of my friends uh, celebrated her thirty third birthday, I think, and she organized a big group to go riding and. Rachel was uh Rachel was there so it was uh, it was <laughs> I should I told you earlier I was like I should have just done the recording there while we were right road biking that would have been <laughs> yeah, outside it was a nice night yeah it was it was a great it was a beautiful night it was it was a lot of fun so um but yes we're not we're not this episode is not about road biking although I wouldn't be opposed to it but uh Rachel is a designer at a local Salt Lake City Oh, what did you call it? Architecture firm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, so yeah, maybe we could just start there and help. I don't know a lot about architecture and what kind of piqued my interest in this was back in when I was living in Chicago, I did a architecture tour boat ride and mm-hmm. it was really cool. And I was, you know, they were pointing out this building, the skyscraper and talking about this architect. Sure. And I was like, man, I wish I knew a little bit more about like what architecture is, like who influences it, what's the current trends. And so I thought it would be good to talk to an expert like yourself. Uh, <laughs> so if you, so let's just start with like the basics. So, um, so what do you do and how did you end up working where you work? Yeah, good question. Um, so I, yeah, I did my undergrad in, in graphic design, so design related field, but then I went to the University of Utah to get my master's in architecture, um, which if you want to become a licensed architect, you do typically usually need a master's in it. There are some workarounds, but you usually need your master's from an accredited un- university to become an architect. Um, so then, yeah, once I graduated, yeah, most people end up going to work for firms. You can do some other stuff. You could do um, projects on your own or, you know, work for different companies and be like an on-staff architect. But most people go and work for different architecture firms. So I've hopped around a little bit to a few different firms, but I am now at FFKR, which I've been there for like two and a half years now. Okay. Um, and it's a little bit larger firm. So we do mostly... Um, commercial stuff. There are some smaller firms that do residential things, but we do uh, kind of a spectrum of different commercial stuff. Okay. So Utah has been growing quite a bit. Have you, there's a couple of new skyscrapers. Are you working on that kind of commercial or like what, what kind of commercial buildings are you working on? Yeah, I, those are always like the dream ones, especially in Salt Lake. We don't get a ton of them. So that's always, um, yeah, those are always the ones people want. But I, when I first started at FFKR, I was on the multifamily housing team. So they did different, um, yeah, like mixed use projects, like apartment buildings. Um, so those are usually like four to five, three to five stories. So not quite skyscrapers, but um, I helped out with a few of those. But there was one skyscraper that had just started when I got switched teams. So that oh, one is down um, kind of by Grand America. So like Main Street and I think 6th South. Okay. Um, and so we, our firm was teaming up with a uh, firm in San Francisco called Gensler. Um, and I didn't work on that project a ton, but my manager was just starting that project. Um, so I heard a little bit about it, but I haven't worked on it since, but I drive past it and try and keep tabs on their progress. I, I know, I know the, I know the, I know the part or the the building you're talking about. I drove by it uh, relatively recently. So, what what's your role in these projects? Are you designing the layout? Or are you, yeah? Can you talk a little bit about what what do you do in the actual projects, or what what does your team do? Yeah. So it, it kind of varies from project to project, just depending on how many people are on the team, the scope of the project, how big it is. But recently I have been, for like the last year and a half, almost two years probably, I've been um, working for a company that's down in Springville and we're doing an office complex for them. 
So there's going to be five buildings in this complex. Um, and right now we're on building number two, which is their office building. And so we have a pretty large team. We have like one landscape architect, we have a few interior designers, and then a few different architects on the team. And so, yeah, in the initial phases, we do some design work. So you're talking about layout and how many rooms you want and how you want them oriented around each other and kind of the need of the space, what you're using it for and what needs you're gonna require of this building. And so that is usually where you're figuring out floor plan and um, yeah, different things like that. But now we're kind of in the phase of getting more specific into like the actual design of each room. And the client is heavily involved in this design process. So there's probably been a little more design in this, but then now that the design is somewhat settled, a lot, a large part of our day, we're in a computer program called Revit, where we're drawing the construction documents. So Revit is the 3D modeling software where you basically build the entire building on the computer. And then from that, you can take different views, you can create the floor plan, and that is where we'll create the construction documents that we'll send to the city to get building permits. And then we'll also send to the contractor for them to build the building from. Got it. So two, two questions I had. Uh, um, one I thought of as you were talking, so I'm assuming the software will tell you like, hey, this is unstable, like the building will fall, you, like you can't do, <laughs> like if you try to do something really funky, the building software would say, oh, this is gonna collapse or is it kind of like SimCity where you can just kind of do whatever, <laughs> whatever you want? <laughs> I love Sims. Uh, it is a little more restrictive than Sims, um, but you still probably could do something kind of crazy and I mean, if the wall isn't gonna like join correctly or walls are running into each other, the software will give you a warning, but it won't necessarily always stop you from designing that. Oh. So we do look over our drawings a lot, a lot. We have a lot of different eyes on them. Um, and- I need to, Do I need to be worried if I walk in into any building and be like, okay, maybe <laughs> this is gonna collapse on me or no? No, you don't because Architects and engineers are held highly liable for the things they design. So oh. they go through a lot of intense review processes. Um, and the engineers, so usually on all, well, yeah, on all of our projects, we'll have a structural engineer. Oh, okay. So we'll like design it, we'll do what we think is good. And then the structural engineer will come in and they'll figure out the beams and like the actual structure of the building and make sure everything works and how it's gonna work and come together so that it doesn't fall down. Cause that's, <laughs> well, that, that's, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. comforting. <laughs> yeah. So you can walk into buildings reassured and you're safe. <laughs> okay. That, that, that's good. That's good to know. Not, not that I'm in skyscrapers a lot these days, but uh, <laughs> just, just something I was thinking about. Uh, well, the other thing I was, I was curious about <clears throat> is the, especially in Utah, uh, what we feel a little bit, but there's just feels like there's a shortage of, and this is just housing, but I feel like maybe it's in general, like there's a shortage of housing, housing market's gone crazy. Uh, and you talked a little bit about getting approval from the city. Uh, I think in my mind, I think part of the problem is yes, the demand for housing's there, but I feel like the approval process to build new stuff is so long. Like if you want to build a new housing development, it takes forever. Um, and I realize you're doing more commercial real estate, but could you maybe talk a little bit about how that approval process is? Is it is it pretty lengthy or is it pretty quick? Like what's, is it a hassle to work? Maybe th that's maybe too harsh. I don't want any city officials listening to, <laughs> to this. And, <laughs> What is it, do you think the approval process is, is a hindrance to building new stuff at times? Um, yeah, I think it can be. So when I was doing the multifamily housing projects, we did work with some developers on those. And, um, and yeah, in, in any project, you do have to go through the city to get building permits and stuff. And depending on the city and like how backed up they are, like they can either be really backed up. So it just kind of takes a long time for your stuff to like 
be up to review. Um, but then and also depending on the city and like their specific requirements or restrictions, some cities can be a little bit harder to get past than others. Just they might have different yeah, just like different requirements you have to meet, different restrictions. Um, are, they, are they like environmental restrictions? Are they like design restrictions? Like that needs to match the rest of the buildings or like what kind of restrictions do you normally see? Yeah, it can be any of that. So it could be, yeah, like environmental. There's usually like parking or occupancy restrictions, oh. fire code restrictions. Um, like in downtown, there's different zones that buildings can only be like certain heights, depending on like what zone they're in um, or like how much land your building can take up on any given lot. There's like ratios in that. Um, so there can be like a lot of different requirements. And, and there's like some that are standard throughout every city, but then there are some specific ones to just different cities that, that they can have different ones depending on where you're at. So I know Park City can be pretty restricted <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and maybe more so than, yeah, than different ones. So you kind of get to know which cities you like to work with and which oh. ones are challenging. So. <laughs> we, we won't have you disclose on the air, but <laughs> we will say Park City is very expensive to live and Springville, Provo, maybe not nearly as expensive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's accurate. <laughs> Fair. Okay, cool. Well, uh, <laughs> well, I guess kind of maybe switching a little bit more to uh, you and like your inspiration for uh, your designing buildings and stuff. Like what's, and this is kind of goes back to that Chicago trip that I took, the little tour. Um, like what made you want to be an architect and like where, what influences uh do you guys like where do you draw a lot of your inspiration or influences from when you're designing stuff is it just pretty standard most of the times like hey this is what a room's always going to look at i guess we'll start with the first questions first so like what made you want to be uh you know an architect yeah i so we moved around a decent amount growing up not like tons but we lived in a, in some different houses and so yeah, I experienced a few different houses, a few different spaces, watched my parents like fix them up and decorate them. And I always thought that was kind of fun. Um, my dad worked in real estate too. So we'd go like walk through different buildings and different homes that were like oh, cool. um, projects of his. So I always liked that. And then in high school, I took a few interior design classes. Um, and I felt like I had more of a natural inclination for like math but I really enjoyed design. And so I liked the architecture kind of joined them a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I don't think architecture uses, once you're actually working in it, doesn't use as much math as people might think, but that's what kind of like, you know, sparked my interest. Like, oh, it seems like a good combination of like math and, you know, laying things out and stuff. But it wasn't quite engineering, but maybe a little on those lines, but then also had like the the design aspect of it that I really like. Yeah, the marrying of math with creativity a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I get that for sure. Uh, so when, like, what's the current influences for design and buildings? Uh, you know, I feel like a couple of years ago, things were all about modern. Now I don't feel like, I don't know. I feel like there's more of a farmhouse you know, mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's the Chip and Joanne influence, you know, their popularity. <laughs> I, I, I mean, this is just me as a casual observer. Uh, mm -hmm. What's, what's kind of like the hot new thing with like design, designing buildings? Yeah, that is a, a good question that I have been thinking about. And I honestly don't know. It's probably, you know, specific to what type of building you're doing. Totally. Um, so in housing, I'm like not really sure, but I did do a little bit of research because I was kind of curious. <laughs> you would uh, <laughs> sent over a question or two to kind of get me thinking. And I thought, you know, I should know this. Um, and so as far as influences go, when we're like starting a project, we'll usually look at like precedent projects. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to do an apartment building that's like roughly this size, we might look at 
similar projects done. Um, and not that we want to copy those, but it kind of gets the juices flowing. You start brainstorming. You can think of, you can see things in real life that you like or maybe don't like, oh, or that okay. might fit the needs of the client or that don't. And so that's oftentimes where we'll start. And then also just like looking um, kind of in like past styles, you know, so if, if someone has seen, you know, like a famous architect's building they like, you can kind of draw from that. Or a lot of time when a client comes to us, they'll, you know, drive around and be like, oh, I was driving here and saw this and really liked that. Or I went to this restaurant and they had this cool thing and, and Pinterest sometimes. <laughs> so I think you can like get a lot of, um, design influence just by like looking around or like staying current on what's going on or like knowing architectural history. So I think it can come from a lot of different resources. Um, but as far as current trends, like I said, I'm not entirely sure in like the residential side of things, but I did find an interesting article and I can talk a little bit about some of those things if you want that I thought yeah totally totally and if you want to share the, the the article or the link i don't know if it's digital but you can share the link and i can share that as part of the part of the episode oh. so people, if they're interested can read it as well but yeah why don't you go ahead and share some of the things you yeah so the things that stood out to me was one virtual reality so we have this cool thing in our office where we can turn our models so these 3d models that i talked about we can um turn into virtual reality models so you can put a headset on and oh, actually cool. walk through your building. Yep. Um, and so that really helps um, increase levels of detail that we can pay attention to. So sometimes when we're doing our drawings, you know, you can miss minor things like, oh, this mechanical duct is going to come through this wall or intersect weird or or this outlet's like in a weird- This wall doesn't spot. join this wall and it's going to fall yeah. over. No. <laughs> high enough and so virtual reality helps us pay attention to that so you can like see in real life so you can see like oh this is kind of weird here like this needs to be fixed here um but then it also gives the client um they can experience spatial relationships um before construction mm -hmm. ends so you know before we had this you just kind of wait till construction ended and get a feel for it but now hope you, hope you hope like this <laughs> yeah but now you can kind of walk through and be like oh i actually don't love that or let's change this or that's like kind of strange um so that's kind of fun and our clients like that a lot that's cool um and then a few other things so it said in this article that kitchen is king so basically saying that the kitchen is the central hub of the household and so um, it talked about how there's not a specific gendered roles and so the family and kind of everyone in the family or in the household is congregating around the kitchen more, cooking more. Um, and so that's where designing you around that kitchen. Yeah, that's where you eat, that's where you hang out, that's where you chat, that's where I work. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so just creating a space that can accommodate all of that and, and hold everyone. Um, and then something I think is really interesting is it talked about refurbish and reform. And so 40% of worldwide carbon emissions comes from building and the building and construction process. Mm, interesting. Which I think a lot of people, you know, would think a lot of our pollution comes from cars or different things, but actually a big part of it is buildings and, and the construction process, but also then just what the buildings emit when they're just functioning and running. Um, and so a sustainable way to reduce the carbon footprint is by just refurbishing old buildings. Mm. Um, and that's also can be, it's not always cheaper, but it can, it can be a little bit cheaper, but it also can just like lower that. But then you also kind of get cool design from that and save some yeah. history. Um, and then also tiny space. So tiny buildings, tiny homes, um, you know, land in cities is decreasing, but people still need housing and different things. And so, um, it talked about quality over quantity and square footage. So maybe you don't have a ton of square footage, but the square footage you do have really making it work for you. So coming up with unique ways to save on space, um, Murphy beds or, you know, different closets under staircases or whatever it is, kind of unique ways to really use all the space that you have. Interesting. Well, we, we just bought a townhome and yeah, it doesn't feel well coming from a one bedroom apartment it feels massive, but, uh, it, it, I, I have noticed, uh, 
they 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 use all the available space we have a we have a closet underneath our stairs and like it's open space like we're 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 thinking of you know putting storage and stuff in there and it's definitely um they utilize all the space that they have and then you just you bought a home not too long ago right uh-huh yeah and it is very small it's not a one-bedroom apartment it's one-bedroom house <laughs> <laughs> everyone always asks me like that exists <laughs> uh yes it does exist um i'm in the avenue so it's a very old house so i think it was even smaller when it was built and then it has surprisingly been added on to um so yeah it's just under a thousand square feet and so i think about that often just how to use all my space, where to store stuff, how to make it efficient without looking cluttered. Um, so yeah, it can be tricky sometimes. Have you have you tried have you done any remodeling on on the home or? I haven't done uh, tons of remodeling. So luckily, the previous owners had kind of redone everything two years oh, before I bought it. Nice. So I haven't had to do much. So I've tried to add my own flavor to things. I put up school shelf <laughs> um, and but yeah I haven't had to do a ton luckily that, that's super nice yeah that's yeah nice. I was gonna say uh the avenues is very for those of my listeners not in Utah not in Salt Lake area avenues is a very cool it's a very cool place to live uh funny enough we when I lived up in Salt Lake we both lived in not at the same time but there's a house called the 420 house <laughs> <laughs> on a, that is uh, one of my favorite, you know, one of my favorite places I've ever lived. It's just a really old home, but it's, it's, it's just a cool, it's just like really cool house. Uh, yeah. yeah. Huge house. Huge we house. We had seven of us in there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I remember because I remember when Brandon, the guy who was taking over the lease from all you ladies, I went with him to go check it out because I was looking for a place to live. And I, yeah, I remember there was like, a girl in like the living room that was her bedroom that was me. Yeah. Oh, it was. <laughs> there was like four ladies upstairs three ladies downstairs it was <laughs> it's like how many people are in here <laughs> it was all come out of the woodworks yeah. <laughs> like there's another one <laughs> yeah it was. but it was a very cool very cool place yeah, uh, yeah it, was, it was cool all right well kind of wrapping up here last question uh so what would you say to someone who, well, I guess any last thoughts or any last things that you would like to talk about? Um, and then my question would be, uh, you know, what would you say to someone who is maybe interested, likes math, but is also very creative? <laughs> or, you know, what advice would you give to them? Yeah. Um, so I, I really enjoy my job. I enjoy my field of work. Um, I advice I would give to someone if they were considering going into the same thing, I would recommend that they job shadow. Um, so I think school is highly focused on like theory and design, which is yeah. so fun. And architecture school was a blast for those reasons. Um, but then once you're actually working in it, it's a little bit different. Um, and so I would just recommend if someone's thinking about it to job shadow so they know that they'll actually like the work they're doing. Um, and yeah, and before I, I, before I went to grad school, I went to the architecture school and just asked a bunch of different people about the program, about their internships, about jobs, and, and tried to do my research a little bit just so I knew what I was getting into. And I felt like I was still a little surprised when I got out and started working. Um, yeah, that's always a shock, for sure. Yeah, but I think most people are. But I think, yeah, if you job shadow and kind of go to some different firms, you can get a, a good idea of if it's something you'll really enjoy down the road. Yeah, that's smart. That, that, that advice, th thanks for sharing. I, I'd say that advice applies to uh, lots of different fields, especially specialty fields. I know uh, some of my friends, I don't know if you remember the twins, uh, but they, one of them was oh, a yes. dentist and he, it was critical for him. He job shadowed a ton and he realized, hey, I don't want to just be a regular family, you know, dentist. I want to specialize a little bit more. And uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I guess I would say super important to shadow especially when we special mm -hmm. yes, for sure so well rachel uh any other things before we, we wrap up here anything else you'd like to share i don't think so no i think we we covered a lot of good things 
Awesome. Well, thanks a lot for coming on. I really appreciate it. And I, I know our listeners will appreciate it as well. Uh, thanks for taking some time this morning and discussing. Oh, yeah. Anything. And uh, yeah, yeah, thanks we'll, for having me. Yeah, you bet. You bet. We'll, we'll, we'll catch you later. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, Matt. See ya.